in going. Oh. Yes, there is a definite reason why you have a handout. I certainly wouldn't expect you to read it. Now, looking at the phenolic compounds present in the grapes, these compounds, of course, are of very great concern to the enologists, of some concern to raisin grape growers, although very little, of essentially no concern to canning viticultures or processors. In fact, their liability, and certainly of great concern to the table grape industry. Now, very briefly, in indicating these, this particular group in here, without going into any uh, detailed biochemistry of the stereochemistry and configurations, are not particularly significant so far as we're concerned in the area with Vitus viniferum. Now, cinnamic acids are significant. They do cause oxidative reactions without browning, as in white wines. They're precursors of the flavanols and the anthocyanins. So this group in here, we are concerned that they lead to the other compounds that are of even more significance, namely the anthocyanins. Then this third group, the flavanols, associated with the bitter flavor and the browning of wine. You recall I mentioned that in the living cell, of the grapevine, let's say in a grape berry, you have a concentration of these simpler phenolic compounds primarily in the vacuoles. You have the oxidase enzymes in the cytoplasm surrounding these vacuoles. As long as these are kept separate, you don't have the browning reaction. But if something happens, that cell is injured or it gets old enough, and this is of concern in storage, it loses this viability, and gradually the cytoplasm loses its semi-permeability. These enzymes then leak into the vacuole, and then you have this complexing <coughs> reaction that brings on those big, enormous tannin-like molecules that are brown. Then in this group of the anthocyanins, of course, we're very aware of those. Your mono and diglucosides, for example, the main pigment in vitus vinifero. And if it's intense enough, you have the essentially a black grape, even though in lower intensities, it is essentially red. And finally, your tannin precursors down here causing the astringent flavors and primarily uh, present in the skin cells and in the seeds. It's a pleasure to have with us Dr. Cleaver today is sitting in. And uh, Mark, would you have a comment to make here, since uh, you have done considerable work in this area? Well, uh, I just might say one comment on, on the anthocyanins there, that they can vary anywhere from two pigment patterns up to ten in, in the different varieties of grapes, but usually the uh, malvidin 3 glucoside is the primary one in most, most wine varieties, although in some table varieties like okay, uh, cyanidin. Uh, is this part of the your basis of your logic that or theory that the toke is perhaps more sensitive to absence of light in the formation of the anthocyanins than, for example, a rebeer or yeah, it, it cabernet? To be with, there seems to be an association with a number of pigments. The, the varieties with the, with the few pigments uh, like the toke and in, well, okay, and uh, Malaga, which only have two or three pigments, uh, seem to be the ones that are uh, that, that do not color in the absence of light, while those that have the general eight pigment pattern uh, will color in the complete absence of light. So there seems to be a relationship there. In other words, the number of pigment bands would be of interest to a geneticist concerned with breeding wine types that have adequate pigment for highly colored wines. 
they are, of course, you... uh, genetically controlled. The, uh, the uh, Pinot Noir type uh, has a four pigment band. Mm -hmm. All the clones that are related to Pinot Noir have always showed the four pigment band. So there is, there is a definite use there in plant breeding. Look at these pigments. Does the class, do you, any of you have any questions? You can direct either to me, and I probably would refer it right to Dr. Cleaver. Concerning, we're not going into great depth here. The main thing I would like to have the class appreciate here would be that there are this, these large groups in the pheno, roughly the pheno family, so to speak, and why they are of significance to different segments of the grape industry. And of course, a lot of the physiology now that is coming up has showing the significance. You mentioned light a moment ago, temperature, maturity, as they may or may not affect the intensity, which of course means the degree of synthesis of these compounds. What is your opinion as to the location of synthesis, uh, Mark? Primarily in the berry? It looks like it's in the berry, although, mm. of course, the precursors of the anthocyanin mm -hmm. come from the leaves. But the actual synthesis occurs in the very old mm -hmm. Are there any other comments? Now let's put this little block of chemistry now in the context of this other biochemistry of the vine. Uh, without any apologies, what I have tried to do here is to boil down a lot of the information that is in that eight-page handout, which of course goes into a lot of detail on the stereochemistry of these various compounds, the carbohydrates, the phenols, proteins, and such as that, to get a little bit of an idea on one page the how this grapevine as a machine operates. Looking first now at the input into the vine, we have up here the, when I say sun, I mean radiant energy in the visible spectrum along with the carbon dioxide in the water. And of course, we're looking at any place where there is chlorophyll, the green part of the plant, which of course is, for the most part, the leaves. At the same time that feedback is coming in, we have from the roots these minerals, at least some of them, all of these in one way or another are significant, and there are others, through root absorption that are fed into this system. Now, going back to photosynthesis here, then you have then the glucose, and then through a series of the enzymes and the phosphate energy transfer systems, you can have back and forth sucrose down here into fructose. You can have it back and forth into starch or back into glucose again. Bear in mind that the plant, I say it stores starch. The benefit of having it stored as starch in the wood, for example, it's a much more compact form of energy. It is very almost insoluble in water, so it can be temporarily locked up, so to speak, until called on again and then converted back into sugar. Or you can have, through a series of changes, through the ascorbic acid, which is one of the acids that we're interested in grapes, but it's quite remote physiologically in the patterns from these over here. And finally, on up to this very unique acid, at least in the plant kingdom, it's, there are other plants, of course, that have tartaric acid, but very few in addition to grapes. So we have quite a different pathway, as the biochemists now think, where the tartaric acid uh, comes from. Then there's this very complicated pathway. I've hedged here and call it carbohydrate catabolism, because you can have many ways of getting down here through an anaerobic process uh, without oxygen, or aerobic through the pentose, shunt, and so forth. One way or another, you can arrive at the pyruvic acid. And this is, again, a sort of a traffic circle in the sense that many streets radiate out from it in the same way as from glucose. The enologist is very concerned if he has a lot of glucose in the must, this pathway here through acetaldehyde to ethyl alcohol, anaerobic fermentation. or back over here to lactic acid if you want the malolactic fermentation. <coughs> then with CO2 fixation, I didn't put that in, you can drop from the pyruvic acid down into the Krebs cycle, which goes in this direction, incidentally. This can go down here, but it can't go any further. Here, you can form this acid, which of course is very minor in our consideration, but it is a step. 
Citric, of course, is a milestone. We're concerned about that one. This one, not so much. It's an intermediary product. It slips through there. Same way here, it's here, and here. Succinic acid is quite an identifiable compound. Fumaric, and then, of course, malic acid, by all means. And as it turns out, the two acids that we're concerned about, 90% of it, is this one right in here. It, you might call it the end of the Krebs cycle and tartaric acid clear up here in left field. Now what's interesting, also at certain of these points, the ammonia brought in through the roots, if it's incorporated in at this stage, can then lead to some of these compounds over here, either from the oxalic acetic acid phase or down here at the succinic acid phase, or over here at the ketoglutaric acid phase and form, depending on the enzymes present in the location, the amino acid, the proteins, the enzymes, flavor volatiles. One example is anthralinate, the compound that gives Concord grapes the aroma and flavor of Concord grapes. And of course, chlorophyll. Now some of these pathways to get to these are very, very complex. Many, many intermediate steps but we certainly won't go into those at this point. In order to make chlorophyll, for example, you have to have manganese. Then, following up over here, there can be a branch off in this anaerobic over to your sterols, carotenes, terpenes, and among the terpenes are compounds that make muscat smell and taste like muscat. Fatty acids, fats, flavor volatiles, many of these compounds that make a Chardonnay a Chardonnay or a white Riesling a white Riesling. In fact, some of those can occur down here too. It depends on whether there's a nitrogen incorporated in the molecule or not. And esters and waxes. Yes? Very minor as far as I know. Mark, have you any opinions on the role of fats in the metabolism of vine? Well, just perhaps not. Really raw. I know they're, they're very heavy in the seed themselves, and of course, the surface supply of carbohydrates when the seed germinates, and then also on the mm -hmm. waxy layer of the, of the uh, skin of the grape. Yes, in the, in the cutin of the grape, where you have the waxes, and also there you do have those long chain fatty acids that polymerize. Yes? What purpose does tartaric acid synthesis serve? Is it a reverse reaction for storage, or is it just sort of a. My understanding is that it's not reversible in the sense that it could be brought back this way to glucose. It does from tartaric acid, of course, by uh, uh, decarboxylation, you see, you get the salts. That is the substitution of potassium, calcium. You get your tartrate deposition. Yes, Mark? Well, Want to theory. amplify on that? Why should a grapevine, why, what is the role of, why should a grapevine make tartaric acid? What is the physiological role of, yeah. of this? And we really don't know this, but mm -hmm. people have speculated that this probably serves in some way to regulate metabolism of other metabolic cycles. And, and there is a little bit of evidence to indicate that might be true. Mm -hmm. It only occurs when the berries and the leaves are rapidly growing. After they reach their mature size, there's no further metabolic uh, tartaric acid synthesis, so it seems like it may be a regulator of metabolism at some point. Mm -hmm. Could it, really don't understand how it does this at mm -hmm. all. Could it be a buffering agent also? Could it be a buffering agent? Well, it is a buffering agent. Now, whether it's made for that purpose, I, of course, wouldn't be able to answer. Being, uh, well, the familiar titration curve that we had and the dramatic buffering effect of this acid, along with the others in the complex, of course, is one of the main reasons why you can't use pH to measure dependably the total titratable acid. Could it, could it be to taste bad so the grapes don't get eaten before the berry, before the... The tartaric acid? Yeah, just to, before the seeds get ripe. I don't, does it taste bad? I don't know. To, certainly there are, there is a basis for certain things, if they're offensive enough, it's a survival factor in certain plants, that's true. Uh, either unpleasant taste, smell, feel, or what have you. There are certain, now whether tartaric acid has an unpleasant feature here that has been a survival factor, I don't know. 
Are there any other questions? <coughs> but it is quite interesting to, that now they have pretty well pinpointed that tartaric acid comes. It wasn't until not long ago that this was known, just how the tartaric acid did come about. But certainly now with this explanation, it becomes reasonable to theorize why the malic acid disappears more readily in the grape towards and during maturity than does tartaric acid. About the only way that the tartaric acid can decrease so far as its acid ability is concerned is by the substitution of the calcium and the phosphate or uh, potassium ions and thereby reducing the CO, the carboxyl groups available to contribute to the acidity. Whereas with the malic acid, there's not only that possibility and reality of, of uh, decarboxylation with these, but also it's right in the respiration cycle and broken down in this energy yielding cycle to produce energy to drive a lot of this whole mechanism. So presumably then the malic acid can disappear also in that way. And this would be a reasonable explanation why the malic acid tends to decrease much more rapidly than tartaric. Now as far as memorizing these compounds, I'm not expecting a lot of that. If you're thinking in terms of how much is he expecting us to know in the final, I think you should have a pretty clear idea of these landmark acids here that we do identify. There are four or five of them that are very important, certainly the citric and succinic, fumaric, malic, and of course as well as the tartaric acid and scorbic acid. And a little interplay in here of our carbohydrates so far as they're either going into storage and out of storage and how they move from there into this cycle where they can then yield the energy that drives these systems. As far as the DNA and RNA, the um, phosphate bonds and so forth, uh, it'd be nice to know it. I'd like to know all of it myself. Frankly, I don't. And I wouldn't expect that. But at least you get a better idea, I hope, of some of the main compounds that we're concerned with. Here we're dealing with structure in the vine. This is a means to get some of the compounds that we want, as well as the hemocelluloses, the cell wall materials, the pectins that hold these cell walls together, and then the phenols that are present primarily in the vacuoles, the anthocyanins, and the tannins, of course, seeds, skin, and then these compounds from this direction here that we have mentioned, the carotene as a pigment, you might say, sterols, terpenes, the fatty acids, fats, volatiles, characteristic esters and waxes. And then the nitrogenous compounds here. And of course, from the, you can immediately read into it which of these are of special significance to an enologist, to a eating fresh fruit, whoever that may be, in raisins, these, uh, this browning reaction in raisins, I should have gone on and mentioned, is of considerable importance because there are basically two types of browning in raisins and they contribute to flavor. One is the enzymatic browning where we have this complexing of these lower level phenols into great complex tannin-like molecules that turn brown. This is the browning that takes place immediately as a grape starts to dry. It's part of the browning that takes place in wines. And then at the final phases, there's the Maillard reaction where the phenols and the sugars, the reducing sugars, can cause further browning. How do you spell that reaction? Maillard, M-A-I-L-L-A-R-D, Maillard. A very important reaction in processing particularly when there are appreciable concentrations of reducing sugars. I don't know whether the Maillard reaction is shown in this series of handouts. I don't believe it is, as I recall. 
It ordinarily doesn't enter in until we get into processing, or in the case of raisins, which is a processing uh, procedure, of course, then it does enter in. And the flavors, the so-called oxidized flavor of a sun-dried raisin, a very identifiable characteristic, and certainly those that are used to that would object to the absence of that flavor. In other words, there is a difference in the flavor of a sun-dried natural raisin as contrasted with a hydra one dehydrated, and it dehydrated very quickly. Because with a rapid dehydration, there is less time for these oxidative processes to take place. So there are differences in flavor. And of course, the Sultana raisin has a different flavor from the sun dry that we have, partly for that reason, the shorter drying period. And then, of course, there is the uh, addition of the dipping materials that would contribute to flavor, too. I anticipated more questions. I thought this would be just about a full lecture period, so I would welcome any comments that you might have or any... Yes? Um, what about the levels of uh, flavored constituents in uh, ripening? How is the tropical Generally speaking, the f flavor volatiles, the esters, or many, many of them are those, are formed in the later stages of maturity as the grape is reaching those higher levels, uh, degree bricks, 20, 22, and on up. Then is when there is the special buildup of these flavors. And this is one of the incentives, of course, to have grapes of so-called normal maturity. In other words, reach those levels of soluble solids to obtain a maximum of these flavors Certainly for table wine, if you want a distinctive varietal character, it is the most mature berry that will have these. And of course, the problem is to get that along with an adequate content of these two, particularly before they are either oxidized or respired or are gradually precipitated as tartrates or malates. I think a, you could make a general statement. Uh, Mark may have a comment on that. You could use the degree bricks as a rough parameter of the accumulation of your flavor components in the grape. Is that a fair statement, Mark? Yeah, but at the same time, remember mm -hmm. that the uh, volatile constituents are very, very much affected by temperature. It's, it's, they are, in low temperatures, they're, they're, they are at their greatest concentrations. In other words, when, for example, in Germany, where you have very long periods of ripening under low temperatures, you get your maximum volatile constituents being built up. While here in the Napa, here in the San Joaquin Valley, where you have high temperatures, you can have very much lower levels of volatile flavoring compounds. So it's very much temperature dependent as well as as sugar and friction temperature. Thank you. Yes. Well, the enzymatic polyphenol oxidase system. The phenol oxidases, which are in the, or the oxidase enzymes in the cytoplasm, and if they are released by the cytoplasm being injured in any way, loses its semipermeability, then it will drive these reactions of the small phenol compounds, molecules, in the vacuole into complexing to these large, complex, enormous, tannic-like molecules, which are brown. That's the polyphenol oxidase browning reaction, the enzymatic browning system, as contrasted with the Maillard reaction, which is not enzymatic. It is not enzymatic, no. I'd like to throw out one other question. It's probably interesting to man up to be of interest to a lot of students here because they're a lot of technology oriented. But I think we can say that there's only two varieties where, which we can identify the characteristic aroma, uh, the, the, where we know the compound that characterizes the aroma, and that's the muscat, which is, is uh, the 
the compound iconic for the muscat aroma is the lenalu alpha, lenalu, uh, which is a terpene alpha. Mm -hmm. And the and the uh, uh, and the conquered grape, which is the methoanthranellate. That's what Those two mm -hmm. varieties, which we have, which we can, which we know the compounds that are that uh, characterize that aroma or that uh, flavoring. In other words, take that compound out, you don't have it. With it, you have it. Only these two varieties do we know of the uh, compounds that mm -hmm. seem to uh, contribute most to the, to the aroma uh, of uh, those of the grapes. I was talking with Dr. Webb here several months ago, and I asked him a, an estimate of the number of compounds that have been identified in grapes and wine. And his best estimate that there were about 200 that have been identified in grapes. And if you included wine and brandy, products of grapes, the figure is something like 400. Now, where of these contribute to a Chardonnay, to a white Riesling? Uh, he did propose it's possible that some of these compounds may be operating together. It may not be just one compound causes a Chardonnay flavor. It may be several. But the one thing they're quite confident of is that whatever the compounds are, they're present in very small amounts. Very small amounts. Yes? Are these flavonol compounds, are they precursors to the electron transport system too, or are those separate? I would like to direct that question to Dr. Clear. Would you repeat that now so that everybody can hear it? Predecessors to the electron transport intermediate. Precursors to the electron transport system. Uh, Flavanols. I don't know. I, I frankly can't answer. I guess there is some in indication that maybe not very many of them are. Maybe there, there is the paradoxin in some of these may, may be implicated in, in this way, but uh, I, don't, I don't think they know. Yes. Are the insoluble? Are there any water soluble pigments in the grape? Mm -hmm. Carotene isn't. I can't think of any. <coughs> Best answer we can give. Are there any other questions? Now for the lab section, there was one other handout that we did not cover, and we will cover that in the hour following this one. And that's pertaining to the synth synthesis pathways for the amino acids and the uh, well I'll find that in just a moment I have that over in a separate hand out here well tartaric the organic acids tartaric malic and the amino acids and that will come up in the next period in case those of you that are meeting next hour were wondering where this comes in yes uh, didn't you say yesterday you were going to do that today in lecture I don't remember getting that. Well, one section had the material on the pathways for synthesis of tartaric, malic, and amino acids. Maybe I'd better throw this on the screen for your... There was a handout. You recognize it? Some do, and some probably don't. So we will take that up in the section this afternoon. And here again, uh, I will spend a little time reassuring you on how much I expect. Now, for one quick uh, comment to tie this together, here is this evaluation. And we'll get that to the back of the room. I wonder if I could trouble you to take that back there to Mr. Cleaver, please. Would you mind handing those out, Mark, as the students leave? And if you would, please, sometime put it in my pigeonhole uh, for my benefit 
and also Dr. Olmos. And since this is the last meeting, why, I might say that this class has probably had the best, and I can say the best attitude of any class in viticulture that I've had the privilege of teaching. I appreciate that, and I hope what we've presented does is some, some meaning to you. So this is it. We'll see you then Friday, 110.